was an owl last night. I looked out and heard anything blow. Yeah. What, uh, what's, what's that? We're getting ready for our Christmas program. We do a oh. program. So we're I thought we were remodeling or something. But. Yeah, no, we're just getting ready for our Christmas program. What's that, December? December 10th, December 16th. Both 10th. at 6 o'clock at night. 10th. Yes, 17th, because seven days after the 10th. <laughs> yeah, no, I majored in history, not mathematics. <laughs> but as we're getting ready for Sunday school this morning, we've been looking at the major series overall as we're looking at what does it take to become a Pentecostal powerhouse. And we're comparing it to the person who is working out, becomes buff, and becomes a physical powerhouse. We call them a powerhouse because they have muscles to the or they're constantly working out. And when we look at um, maybe their abs or their arms or their biceps, you know, you might look at them, wow, I can't get my hands around. That didn't happen overnight. They didn't take a magic pill and all of a sudden their muscles gained. They didn't go through this or go through that and all of a sudden, poof. That's true. It happens over time through a gradual process, through consistency. They're constantly going to the gym or they're constantly working out. Um, they're constantly staying faithful with the leg day, back day, whatever they're focusing on. You don't gain muscle overnight. It takes consistency. If you're wanting to become buff and puff and enter all those competitions, it takes time. Same way with the Lord. You've got to study and you've got to keep in the Word. Absolutely. And that's what we're looking at is if we are going to become spiritual powerhouses, it is going to happen when we're faithful to God every single day. Reading the Bible the way we're supposed to. Praying every day like we're supposed to. Developing our relationship with God. Getting closer to God. Getting closer to God. And we started off by talking about faith and how we need faith to get close to God. Everything's based on faith. Even the atheist has faith that there is nothing out there. But if we're going to be effective in spiritual things, it's going to be when we experience and we grow in faith. And we talked about the enemy of faith, which is doubt. Jesus rebuked the disciples when he came out of the wilderness for not being able to cast out the demon. And we all go back there and we all talk about spiritual warfare, how some don't come out by prayer and fasting. But before he gave them that instruction and that piece of knowledge and wisdom, there's one reason he told them that the demon didn't come out in the first place. And it was because you doubt it. We moved on and we started looking at the armor of God. And last week, we, uh, and we looked at the book of Ephesians. And the verse I want to reference is actually not in Ephesians. Oh, it is. Ephesians 6 and verse 11. Where God instructs us to put on the armor of God. But he doesn't instruct us just to put on pieces of the armor. But he instructs us to put on the whole armor. Every single piece. All the parts that are meant for offensive, but also all the parts that are meant for defensive as well. Not just protecting ourselves, but defending ourselves. Last week we looked at the article of the armor that is probably the most central piece to it all. It holds everything together. And what is the piece that holds the armor of God together? The belt. The belt. And what is the belt composed of? What is our spiritual belt of truth? Belt of truth. We talked about last week how there are lots of quote unquote truths in this world. But truth is what holds the entire armor together. And what did Jesus say about truth? He said, I am the way and the truth. Jesus holds everything together. The truth of God's word holds everything together. When we allow man's quote unquote truth to enter into our spiritual, I hate to call it spiritual realm, but enter into our spirituality, enter into our mind, what we classify as truth, our armor is not held as tightly and as firmly as it should be because we are mixing it with the truth of this world and not the pure truth of God's word. And we are allowing ourselves open for attacks of the enemy. We're allowing gaps in our armor. is not held to our side the way it's supposed to be. And when we do that, we are on dangerous grounds. Because we've already compromised our armor. 
is not going to be as effective as it should be. And we talk about how do we obtain truth? Well, we obtain truth by seeking a relationship with God, the one who is true. If we are truly seeking after God, the Holy Ghost will reveal truth to us. If we allow the Holy Ghost to reveal the truth of God's word to us, unadulterated, without us throwing in there, oh, God says this, but I think it's a little bit this way too. If we allow it purely, our armor is held together so tightly that nothing can get through and penetrate us. And if we are truly seeking God in every way possible, <coughs> with the sincerity of our heart, our armor is held firmly intact. We pray to know what the truth of God's word is. Because there is power in prayer. And if we really want to know what the truth of God's word is, sometimes we do have to find ourselves in our prayer closet seeking God, saying, God, reveal this to me. You know, there are lots of things in this world that man thinks concerning the Word of God. You can pull out five different commentaries and get five different opinions on a particular verse. But when we allow God to reveal to us what that verse really means, our belt is composed completely of truth. And it's, our armor is not compromised. Sometimes man thinks this and man thinks that and I think this is the way it's supposed to be, or you think that's the way it's supposed to be, or Brother Dennis doesn't think that's the way it's supposed to be. It should be done this way, and I have another step. We all can think different things. But when we get down on our knees and seek the truth of the Scriptures through prayer, God will reveal it to us. And that is the pure truth. You know, the old, when you come back to the old phrase, God said it, I believe it, that's good enough for me. Sometimes, that's where we need to find ourselves. Away from what man thinks, to find out exactly, God, what is the truth of the matter? Today we're going to be looking at the breastplate of righteousness. We find that in the same verse that we took um, last week, Ephesians 6 and verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. If someone would else if someone would please read Romans chapter 4 and verse 6. Romans 4, 6. Even as David also described the blessedness of the of the man, of the man, of whom God gave the righteousness of God. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man. Unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I messed up in your notes at the very beginning. There is no Jisu in that verse. So you can cross that out at the top of your notes in the main text. But we are looking at the breastplate of righteousness. Why are we to put on the breastplate of righteousness? God already instructed us to put on the belt. Because the belt by itself is of no avail. Sure, growing up, I'm sure we all heard our parents say, well, don't make me get the belt. And that belt, a whole different thing for us back then. It had power and it had force. But Jesus told us to put on the whole armor of God. So we not only put on the belt of truth, but we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. When we look at the uniform that's being portrayed here, Paul is referring to the Roman soldier of his time. And he's referring back to something physical that his readers could relate to. The church there at Ephesus. This is a tool that Jesus used many times throughout his ministry. Except for, we call them parables. Earthly stories with heavenly meaning. He was putting it on a level where everybody could relate to and understand. Paul is doing the same thing here. He's giving them pieces of the Roman armor that everyone is familiar with. When we look at the Roman bre uh, breastplate, it was sometimes had different models. They were created of solid metal, while others were created with pieces of metal that were linked together that allowed for freer movement, kind of like chain metal. metal. If we go back to the Old Testament, the armor back then was more like scales laid over top of one another. Regardless, 
the breastplate served the same purpose regardless whether it's Old Testament, whether it was New Testament, whether it was the Romans, whether it was the Greeks, whether it was the Hebrews, Philistines. And that's because the breastplate had an important purpose. It was to protect the major organs. It was to protect the stomach, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, and especially the heart. That was the main purpose of the breastplate. To protect those major organs that if they would have got struck, they could have brought someone to their death. And if you're off fighting a war, that's one thing you don't want to do. You don't want to die. A lot of people today don't want to die to begin with. So that's a, we all can relate to that aspect of life. But the breastplate was to protect the individual in war. And it was composed of two pieces, typically. One that went over the front, and a piece that went over the back. Why? Because we are protecting our major organs from all sides. Because it goes back to how many enemies do we have out against us as Christians? More than we could ever number. We just know that one third of the host of heaven. And from what side are they coming from? Sometimes we might be fighting one enemy. Sometimes we might be fighting a hundred enemies coming from all around us. So the breastplate is to protect us in every direction. Guard those vital organs. But it is com our breastplate is not composed of metal. It is not composed of brass. It is not composed of steel. It is not composed of gold, silver. It is not underlaid with anything or overlaid with anything. It is not physical. But rather, our breastplate is composed of righteousness. If we turn to the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, Zechariah, chapter 3, really this is our breastplate here. And I'll go ahead and read it because I'm going to read the whole chapter. Zechariah, Malachi. So Zechariah, chapter 3. Second to last book in the Old Testament. And the Bible reads this. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? When Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel, and he answered and, st and spake unto the, those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among thee that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wandered at, for they... For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Also, the branch is a reference to Jesus Christ. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the gravings thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove thy iniquity out of the land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So when we look at this passage, we find that Joshua is starting off wearing something particular. Do you remember what the Word of God states that Joshua is wearing? He's wearing filthy garments. But what does the angel of the Lord do to those garments? Uh, 
He got rid of those old garments and put on new ones. What are we seeing here? We are seeing what we refer to in big terminology as the imputation of righteousness. That is mentioned time and time again in Romans chapter 4, I believe it is, where God takes our righteousness and gives us his righteousness. When we look at our, what is righteousness? Righteousness refers to the distributing of justice fairly without any bias or showing partiality equal and fair in all distributions of judgment. It also refers to morality or holy living. When we look at man as a whole, is man capable of performing pure righteousness or just, just righteousness? No, man is not able to perform such things. Why? Because first of all, how many of us, if we were to be honest, are biased to some degree? If we go into a courtroom and the judge is making the decision, can he be biased in any way? May he maybe take one side or as you're going through seeing the um, evidence, well, he must be guilty, so it must be this way. Maybe that's not the case, but he can develop a bias. And whether it's pure in heart or, or pure intent on his part, is not completely pure because it is still biased, it is still fallible, it is still flawed to some degree. None of us can be perfect, the bottom line. Is that, what, is that what you're trying to say? I mean, that's what I get out of it. You know, you see some Christians uh, think they're perfect, and to me, they're wrong. I mean, there's no perfect human being on the earth besides Jesus Christ in all the Jesus is the only perfect one. We are perfect through Jesus Christ. But when we are left to our own devices, if we are to make that decision, we're flawed to some degree. We cannot make a perfect judgment call. Now, now, Not what, in ourselves. What, what are you saying there? You're perfect through Jesus Christ. We can be perfect through Jesus Christ. How, how can you be perfect? Because when we ask Jesus into our heart, when we ask him to forgive us of our sins, Correct. we then at that point, to a degree, we are sanctified. We are made perfect. We are then, as we see with Joshua, our old filthy garments are taken off, and we are given the garments of Jesus Christ. You. Now, at the same time, is all sanctification is also progressive. We need to work on ourselves. Are you saying you feel guilty? Like back before I accepted the Lord, I could do something terribly and never, never bother me, never lose the sleep. No, I'm I accepted not... Jesus Christ, and I started feeling guilty when you knew something was wrong and you didn't want to do this for this part. You That's know what, what I mean? That you knew it was evil and you knew it was wrong to do this or do anything, and then it bothered you. It seemed like I had a guilt. You know what I mean? It is a guilt. And what that is, that's the, that is conviction. That's something different. That's the Holy Ghost dealing with you on a particular area. Or um, it could be Him restoring your conscience because there's a point we can get in life that if we keep doing something, that we become, our conscience becomes seared as a hot iron, as the Bible describes it. There's no feeling. The nerves are gone. But if we've done something bad and the Holy Ghost is dealing with us, that is conviction. That's a little bit different. That's not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about here is when God looks down on us, he doesn't see our old self. Because when man is born, every single one of us, we are born into sin. As Romans, I think, 6.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we look at our righteousness, what we think is right, what we need to do, what we think we ought to do, and I want to talk about that here in a little bit, if you give me a moment, but that's what I'm talking about there. Our own decisions in our own selves are flawed. God is the only righteous judge. He is the only one that can say, well, this is right, this is wrong, and judge us fairly according to what our action is. And that's what we're talking about right now, are our actions, what we think is right, what we think is just. Because man in ourselves, 
And even right now, if we were to make a judgment call, it might be flawed. To me, as a Christian, you, you, we all have weaknesses. So it seems like the devil is going to attack your weaknesses. Yes. You know, when I first stopped drinking, I'd have Jimmy Savage and him stop at my house, start to drag me out. Uh, ask me to go up, not try to drag me out, but um, to go up the nights homeless at night. And, you know, I tell him I ain't drinking, but you know, I can't go. But anyway, it seems like someone's knocking at your door when you're fighting something that's sinful, you know. Like, I'm not home. So mm -hmm. I tried to stay away from it because I couldn't be around it because it was too weak. Mm -hmm. You follow me? I follow you. And now I'm strong enough that I could go in, but I still don't want to go into a bar room because, you know, it just it bothers my anger. I got an anger problem here. Well, to be honest, we shouldn't be going into bar rooms to begin with as Christians. We are to abstain from all appearance to begin with. Whatever the reason is, we should not be going into a bar room. But what I'm talking about is our morality, how we judge things. That is flawed. God is the only righteous judge. He is the only one who can judge a man fairly, without any bias. Because we all have bias to a degree. And when we look at our judgment well, 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 calls... Excuse me, what's your definition for bias? Is it? Bias. No, we, you lean towards one side or the other. So you favor somebody. You favor somebody. Oh. That is bias. Okay. So you favor somebody. Or you favor something. Or you're going to lean one way or the other. And when we look throughout the word of God, we know that man did that which was right in his own eyes in the book of Judges 17, verse 6. If someone please read Judges, Judges 17, 6. And someone else, Proverbs 21 and verse 2. Proverbs 21, 2. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no king of Israel, but every man that did that which was right in his own eyes. What does Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2 states? Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. So we can do something, and without the word of God, we'll think that it's right. Because who's the judge? We're the judge. We're deciding what's right and what's wrong. We're deciding what we can do, what we can't do. Our ways are as filthy racks because of that. Because we don't know what truth is. We've been polluted because of sin. We've already said this morning, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Adam sinned in the garden, what was once pure, which was once holy, which was once perfect in every way, was tainted and corrupted. Mankind became corrupted because Adam chose to disobey God. Sin entered into the world. And because of that, when we do what is right in our own eyes, we're biased. We do what we want, and that's it. In fact, if we look at the world in which we live in, how many times do we do that? You tell somebody about the Word of God, well, I don't think God's like that. God's a loving God. Where are they getting that from? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's what I think. That's what I think. What does the Word of God say? God, God is a loving God. The Word of God does follow up with that. But they're choosing to ignore the rest. So they're doing that which is right in their own eyes. What trouble does man get into when he does that which is right in his own eyes? Where does that lead us? Well, we find that exact, exact location in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. What does Genesis, ch ch Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 read? We're going back to the day of Noah. And where did man's judgment call get him? Where did his, when he did right in his own eyes, where did it get him? It got him to the point where his imagination was continually evil. He was only thinking evil things. That's what happens when man 
does that which is right only in his, in his eyes because he becomes the judge. In his eyes, he decides what is right and wrong. And that is why our righteousness is as filthy rags. Because we are not a true judge. We do that which we want to do. We do that which we think is right. And we base everything upon that. And what I think is right could be completely different from what Brother Terry thinks is right, which could be, both of those could be completely different from Brother Eli's definition of what is right. Why? Because we are all doing things which is right only in our own eyes because we've become the judge. And because we are partial to us, our righteousness is as filthy wraps. It is biased. It is not good for anything. We use the illustration I had picked on you last week, Brother Terry, that if we took our old rags of righteousness, our old rags, and try and clean off that oil dipstick, it'd be dirtier than before because our rags are filthy. They're of no good. They're of no use. But the righteousness of God is pure. It is holy. When we look at Joshua here in this verse, his righteousness, his good deeds, or his judgment calls, his morality in himself, they're as filthy rags. And God said, that's not good. He needs to get rid of those. To be one of my servants, he needs to put on clean rags. He needs to have clean garments. When we look at the word of God, is God coming back for a church with filthy rags? No. He's coming back for one without spot and without wrinkle. What is that referring to? The righteousness of the saints. The sanctification of the saints. What is that? Those who have put off their old ways, their old lifestyle, their old righteousness, their old way of thinking, realizing that they're not doing what is right in their own eyes anymore, but they're going to do that which is right in God's eyes. Why? Because God is the judge. He's the final say. What I say could be right, God could say is, no, that is wrong and that is sin and you need to stop doing it. And on judgment day, I'm not going to be behind the podium saying, Justin Layman, you did this, 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 you're all good, go on through. But rather, God is going to be the judge. And he's going to be judging by the ultimate standard, which is Jesus Christ. He is going to be judging us according to his word. And because we have his word, we are going to be found guilty. Or I should say, our mouth is going to be able to be stopped because we can't throw out this excuse. Well, so-and-so said I, it was all right. This big name evangelist said that I could do it and it'd be all right. You know, God, this, this email I got said that if I sent it to ten different people, I would be blessed. What is right in our own eyes is not necessarily right in God's eyes. When man keeps continuing doing what is right in his own eyes, not only is our righteousness as filthy rags, not only are their imaginations wicked continually, and we can see that in the world that we're living in, how much wickedness is around us? How many people are trying to do that which is right in their own eyes? And I'm not just talking sinners. I'm talking about preachers, evangelists, televangelists. We're looking at people that even once used to attend church here, that are doing right in their own eyes. And where has it gone them? Homosexuality, drug abuse, uh, alcohol abuse. They've gone their, maybe it's not that bad, maybe they've gone their own way. But why have they got themselves into those predicaments in their situations? Because they've done that which is right in their own eyes. Why did God say that he gave this uh, person home over to idolatry and homosexuality? Because they chose not to know God. What is that? They did that which was right in their own eyes. Well, I'm not a bad person. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't steal anything. I never did this. What are they doing? They are judging themselves and doing that which is right in their own eyes. But they are never judging themselves according to the word of God. And when we do that, when we do that which is right in our own eyes, our, breast, our breastplate is flawed. 
There are cracks in it. It's not held together the way it should be because it's not the way it should be. Because our breastplate is based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That when we ask him into our heart, when we ask him to forgive us of our sins, he takes away our old righteousness, our old